there's two sides to every code Then there's a conversation you can join But I'm an old dog and there's new tricks And some of my opinions you just can't fix Cause I'm an old man yelling at the sky I'ma shake my fist at the clouds and cry Get off my lawn you snowflake Before I have a meltdown, breakdown, shakedown Cause this is my hometown, so back down Sports clown, it's all just a game And it's the last down, let down, cow town I said it's all just a game I give the touchdown, the run down, the low down Cause it's over the game Gonna crack down, shut down, the sun down I said, uh, I said, uh, I said it's all just a game Happy Friday, kids. Uh, welcome to the program. Feeling a little fallish today. I won't lie to you. Uh, the weather's been incredible. Not that it matters, but uh, feeling a little fallish today. The colors are out or almost gone now because of the wind. Uh, and I'm not sure why I'm tap dancing or delaying. There's no reason to. Welcome, 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 welcome to Just a Game. I am me, you are you. Um, back in uh, Treaty 7 territory. A um, little bit of a, an excursion away. Uh, thank you for bearing with us. Um, Technology is a funny thing. So we acknowledge that there were some gaps and some delays in, in the interviews that we did the last three shows. But we're back in studio. Eric DeHatchuk from The Athletic will join us. Um, can't wait to talk to him about one of the results so far we've seen in the season. If you're an Athletic subscriber, you probably know the game I'm talking about. Um, with that said, since last we spoke, some things have transpired. Uh, the local hockey heroes played their first game and we made a prediction, Jack, Jet, you and I, we made predictions and we weren't far off. We said four, two, it ended up five, three. Yeah. Right. We were pretty close. So it wasn't Joe Burrow like, but it, it was, yeah, I'm still, it's still, I have no false sense of security of this. I, I, I'm not all of a sudden going to start making a whole bunch of predictions, but uh, we were a little bit close on that one. Um, and again, Jack's here. So if you got questions, comments, throw them in the, uh, in the, in the machine and, uh, we'll get to them at the end of the show for sure. Um, the flames are in route to Pennsylvania or in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure which I don't have their itinerary. Uh, they will play the penguins tomorrow. They have the, um, luxury of sitting in Pittsburgh tonight, watching the penguins play Washington. So, uh, when they get the Penguins, it'll be in back-to-back -back situations early on in the season. I don't think it really means a lot. Um, thought it was interesting. Think it's interesting. Um, I, I think it's a situational, con what I call a situational conversation. I think there are things that happen, and, and because of the situation, you go, oh, well, you know. Uh, now they're out on the road. Oh, great. They start out on the road. Last year, remember, they played all those games at home. Oh, no, it was terrible. Oh, get out on the road. We can bond as a team. We can do team building things. We can go have dinners and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Uh, it's a results oriented business. Uh, Pittsburgh tomorrow, which by the way, uh, will be at my afterburner debut uh, for this season after that game. So immediately following that game, uh, I believe it's Danny Austin and myself. Uh, so we'll have full uh, coverage. Although, um, Jack and I are currently negotiating the amount of time I'm allotted um, <clears throat> because he has no interest in doing a five or six hour post game show. It is a Saturday night. It so. is a Saturday night. And you have dancing to go do, right? Yeah, I have things you to have, attend. Yeah, yeah. It, it, things to attend, formals and stuff. So it, at some point, yes. Um, and then off into uh, Washington and Columbus and Eastern, Eastern Tour, do it early. Um, so. I want to start with the 5-3 win. And I want to, I, I want to, actually, I'll, I'll start before the 5-3 the win. Um, the last show, we did the 10 things I think, I think, I think. Um, an homage to Peter uh, King's uh, football column in the USA Today many, many moons ago. Um, 
and and Jack shared it with me. And I said, well, I'm going to put it on social. I'm going to say, if you if it, for no context, don't listen to the the podcast, and then just think whatever the hell you want to think. If you want context, listen to the podcast, and, and this stuff will make more sense. By the way, the 10 things that I think I think only had nine things. But I, I found this odd. Not odd. It's it's not odd. It's it's the social media way. It's the world we live in. You spelled Coronado wrong. And I agree with the rest of it. Okay. I did. I spelled. Jack didn't because Jack wrote exactly what I asked him to write. I wrote Matt Coronado's name wrong. But it's incumbent upon us in this society now to tell you your mistake and then go, but it's okay, I agree. Um, I went through this a long time ago, um, the the uh, the blogging at 960. They said, you guys can blog anytime you want. Here's access, go ahead and blog. So I blogged every day. I was the first guy to write lines and the first guy to, to you know, do blogging from, but it was terrible because I can't write. Um, and there there is a very entitled angry lady who lives in Calgary that was very angry with me because I always in my call in my blog wrote Jerome J E R because that's what spell check changed it to. Right. One thing yeah. I did that the other day on uh, when we had Connor and he was talking yeah. about Jerome and in the, in the show notes, yeah. I spelled it exactly like that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and people do not take that well. And I get that. I get that. Um, but for me, it was my fear of spell, spell correct or, or, you know, whatever. Because, well, it's changing it. And then eventually I just taught the machine to, you know, spell it J-A. So anyway, I, I thought it was odd that, yeah, I like it, but I got to tell you what you did wrong first. Oh, yeah, but. Yeah, but, and I apologize. To, it was only one guy and I'm, I'm having a fun at his expense. It's all good. Yeah, I did spell Matt Coronado's name wrong. So I'm watching this game and the Flames are playing the, the Winnipeg Jets. And what do we talk about? Well, we talked about Markstrom. And what do we, what do we need Markstrom to avoid? That early goal, right? That early goal. So if you, if you two screen these things, which I tend to do, watch the game and follow along on social media, there was a, a ton of angst. The city was full of angst that Markstrom was going to give up an early goal. He didn't. As a matter of fact, he played really, really well. And the Flames got a lead. And then he gave up the, oh, he's got to have that. Yeah, sure, he stopped the first 10. But he's got, yeah, but he's got to have that. All right. So he's got to have that. And this is not me um, running down analytics. I, I love analytics. Um, I wrote the forward to Rob Volman's latest, last edition of Hockey Abstract. I was bringing on analytics people before analytics people were cool. This is not me running down analytics. But it was a little funny to watch along in this game and certain people going, yeah, they're leading, but look at the heat map. Or, yeah, they're winning, but look at the five on five. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, it's the yeah, but stuff we got to get rid of. It's the yeah, but it's game one of a new season. And may I remind all of us, new systems, new systems. New systems. Jacob Markstrom was excellent. The reason they won. But I got to tell you, watching that game, I saw a team that's thinking. And thinking just hurts the ball club. Thinking just hurts the ball club. They have new systems. They have new requirements. All of these things. They are thinking. I don't know what Jonathan Huberto was thinking in the first period when he recovered the puck below the goal line in his own end and decided to go between his legs and fire it up the middle, intercepted. Um, there was a goal against scored on a simple clearing play in which Markstrom knocked it down and they couldn't get it out. This is a team that is still thinking about its systems. So they won. Yeah, but Winnipeg was better. Okay. 
Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. The heat map, the heat map, the heat map. Look at the heat map. I can't believe the heat map. Well, um, it's one game, kids. Now, they got the win, and Markstrom was excellent. I thought Markstrom was really good. I uh, stopped 30, uh, what was it, 34 or 37 in this. Um, blocked a lot of shots, which is cool. Commitment to defense, but I think had that has to do with the fact that they're still not comfortable with their systems. I thought their breakouts were sloppy, still not comfortable with their systems. Here is the thing, and it was funny, because, Jack, we got asked a question about coming from behind. Right. Remember, you asked me that question on on Wednesday. Yeah. Somebody asked, "Do you think they have the?" Yeah, if they're built to come from behind in games. Okay. This doesn't exactly answer it, but I thought this was really interesting. Winnipeg ties it at one. Three minutes and two seconds later, it's two one Calgary. Winnipeg ties it at two. Two minutes and thirty seconds later, it's three two Calgary. Winnipeg ties it at three. Four minutes and ten seconds later, it's four three Calgary the punchback, the response, the not dropping your, your, your jaw and pouting. Um, but I can't sit here and go, well, don't worry about the analytics in game one. And then go, look at this. This is, this is proof that they're going to win a cup. That's not it. Um, I just thought that was interesting that they took a punch and then they fired back with one. Um, all due respect to, um, the great crew on television, whether or not Rasmus Anderson knocked that puck down with a high stick is is a moot point. It wasn't called. So they tie, they, they go ahead with the shorthanded goal. Um, these are, the, the reason I bring that up is these are the types of things that seem to align against them last year. That would have been called. That would have been a penalty and, and you know, or not a penalty, sorry. It would have been a, a whistle and it, it would have deleted that play. Um, the other one I thought was funny was, yes, 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 Jonathan Huberto had two points, but he got him at the end of the game. Right. The game-winning goal and the insurance goal. So I get it. Like, we, we, none of us want to be considered homers. Understand that. Not promoting homer, homerism at all. But I think we're also a little bit, you know, really quick to – couch everything with a yeah but yeah but is the worst phrase in the history there's nothing ever good you tell me the last time jack you do a great job yeah but i'm gonna give you a raise that no that's not a phrase anybody uses right you know uh jack you're amazing at what you do yeah but i'm gonna get you a car for free uh, that, that, that's, that's not sensical yeah but is a terrible were a phrase terrible i mean it's it's counterproductive in society is counterproductive in sport were the flames great no they weren't did winnipeg deserve a better fate cool sure but it's game one with a team with a new system with a new coach can we all relax about the heat maps can we all relax about the five on fives we'll get the data they have to start all over again in pittsburgh tomorrow pittsburgh should be ornery tonight in washington taking on the, the uh, Ovi and the Caps uh, because they didn't look good against Chicago and they blew that one at home. Um, we'll see. I wasn't as disappointed as many seemed about that win. Um, they got outshot almost two to one. Yeah, remember last year? What were they doing? Out shooting teams two to one. Weren't winning games. Um, one game. They found a way. Have, having spent almost two decades watching this team lose the first game of the year every year. And that just sucks the air right out of the balloon. Ask everybody in Edmonton how they feel today. Ask them how they feel. It's one game, but man, it can suck the air out of you. Especially you have a good training cap and then boom. And I, I firmly believe that that game last Friday in Vancouver was had to be a wake-up call. Preseason game, yes, but had to be a wake-up call because it looks so much like last year. I didn't think Wednesday's game looked like much of last year. Looked like a couple years ago. I thought Markstrom was excellent. I like the resiliency. Don't worry about Matt Coronado. 
I'll, I'll learn how to spell his name. And I'm, and prior to that, he will score. That kid is going to find the back of the net in this league. Um, Greer was interesting to me. Ruzicka was interesting to me. Walker Dewar was quiet for me. Um, I thought Backlund's line, uh, there was a little bit of ju- juggling going on. Mangiapane, I mean, we uh, didn't we not talk about Dubé on the top line? And by the end of the game, Mangiapane's there, right? Yeah. So, you know. By the way, I should point this out as a good Nation Network uh, employee. Um, if you haven't gone to DF, where, where's our line? What's the website we got with lines now? Daily Face Off. It is DFO, eh? Daily Face Off. Yes. They've got the line combinations and the goalies and everything like that. Like, it's awesome. It's awesome. So, um, but they mean nothing because by the end of the game, the lines have changed. But it's a great, it's a great resource. It's a great primer. Uh, uh, anything else? Nah. What? A couple of hits? Like, Zadorov had a big hit, um, but that if I that's the one thing that I I, I they need more snot. I, I'm just going to keep going back to that. They need more snot. Um, I like Winnipeg a lot. I like Adam Lowry. He's a captain. I like his lineage with his dad. Um, I like Josh Morrissey. I like Hellebuck. I like that team. I think that team's capable of being a playoff team. Um, and what can you say about? Uh, Connor, Kyle Connor. Holy cow. This, this guy, I, I, and maybe that's a conversation or, or at some point we should have is the greatest under the radar players of all time. Is Kyle Connor not the greatest current under the radar player in the league? Because what was that, Jack? His sixth game, first game of the season, he scored it. Like he's consistent. Yeah. Right? Like he just buries the puck. And he was dangerous all night. He was dangerous all night. Is he like for you? Who who else would fall in that category? Like, just kind of under the radar a bit. Puts up forty goals every year. Maybe Jake Gensel. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. I go along but with that name. With if he's healthy, yeah. yeah. But man, Connor's good. He's got a nice release. Would you take a Matt Coronado uh, career path like Connor? Oh, any day, right? Man, he was good. Uh, shaky starts. Whew. Uh, we made reference to the things that I've stolen from other people. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are fans of the Rich Eisen show. I love the Rich Eisen show. Overreaction Monday. Like, I love Overreaction Monday. When you do overreaction after the NFL, you know, Monday, who needs to be fired and all. I love that. Now I think they have their own podcast called Overreaction Monday. Um, overreaction, Edmonton 8-1 against uh, Vancouver. Um, I'm glad for a lot of reasons, but I like Woodcroft as a coach. What the hell are you doing playing games with your starter? Who's starting? I'm not going to tell you. You have to buy a ticket. That crap is so old. And by the way, this, this coming from the guy who is on the outside of the sports gambling industry, it's not my thing. But I also smart enough to recognize it's the NHL's thing. You guys had better start acting like adults because gambling is is paying a lot of your bills right now. So let's let's stop with the I'm not going to tell you who the starting goalie is. Um, I felt for Jack Campbell. I don't know if how many of those goals you fault Jack Campbell on, but I fault you know the the. They trumpeted how great his preseason was and how awesome he was and everything like that. And then you get your doors blown off. I'm sorry. That's that's hard cheese, man. That's hard cheese. And the day before that game, uh, controversy abounds in Vancouver because Connor Garland wants out his, his agents, you know, looking for a trade. Did Jack, fact check me on this. Connor Garland scored in that game, did he not? Yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Okay. <sighs> Doesn't appear to be the big problem that everybody thought it was, no. right? You know who else scored in that game? Who's that? Brock Besser. I think he scored four times. Yes, he did. Yes. <clears throat> Overreaction. Overreaction. Um, Buffalo getting kicked at home last night, 5-1. Just spent billions of dollars on two young defensemen who who deserve it. Don't get me wrong, Owen Parter. Uh, or Parter. Owen Power and and uh, Rasmus Dahlin are are fantastic defensemen, 
um, and the cornerstone of that team and yada, yada, yada. But I think we were all kind of expecting Buffalo to come out and, you know, be competitive. Didn't look like it. Um, and Seattle losing 3 nothing in Nashville. Seattle has now lost two games in a row. Um, and we got that quite another question we got, Lat, right? Somebody yeah, was asking. Someone us, was asked if they'd take a step back this year. So it's overreacting. I, I grant you that. It's overreacting. Um, anyway, uh, we told you Calgary now on the road. We'll have afterburner for you tomorrow following the game against Pittsburgh. Looking forward to that. Um, Eric DeHatchek coming in in a little while. I want to quickly jump around a little bit to some other sports. Um, let's give some love to the Cavalry. I believe uh, Barnburner had guest on today. The Cavalry at home tomorrow to the Forge, which I believe is Winnipeg. Um, win and they move. If Cavalry win, if I understand this correctly, they move right to the final. If they lose, they get a second life. So uh, three o'clock at Atco Field. Make sure you get out there. It'll be a fine fall weekend. Uh, there is sporting action in our city tonight of the other football kind as the Rough Riders of Saskatchewan are in town to take on your Calgary Stampeders. Um, and I defer to Danny Austin on this, uh, live from the 55. You should always get your football information for Danny Austin. Uh, I was shocked by this, Jack. I thought they were eliminated, but they're not eliminated. There is still playoff potential here for the Stampeders. There is a chance, yes. <laughs> so you're saying <laughs> there's, there's a, a chance. chance. I don't think it's a very good chance. No, but. no. But get out there and support them. Um, uh, yeah, let's do this one. Some baseball for you. The, the playoffs continue. Take a look at this. Uh, these are the teams advancing. These, these are what your division or your, uh, your uh, league finals are going to look like. Uh, the Phillies, the D-backs, um, the uh, um, Rangers, and Houston. Um, missing out of that... What were the win totals, Jack? You told me. Ooh, I think there was like four teams that had 100 wins. It was Atlanta, the Dodgers. Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore. And then Tampa had 99. Yeah, Tampa had 99. All eliminated. All gone. All gone. Um, left too much, perhaps, uh, on the table during the regular season? Or, or not left, but used up too much? I don't know. Um, the D-backs uh, being led by Gabriel Moreno, <clears throat> former J. Um, that's not going over very well. Um, the Rangers, I, I just go all the way back to the bat flip. I, I just don't, you know, the Rangers, that won't make anybody in Toronto happy seeing them being successful. And, and Simeon's on that team too, right? So there's some J ties there. Um, speaking of the Jays, uh, about eight days later, after um, his general manager went and poured gasoline and, and uh, you know, flicked lighters and and pocket rockets at the uh, tire fire that was the end of the J season. Uh, Mark Shapiro came in yesterday and cleaned everything up. Um, or did he? I, I'll tell you, I I have zero faith in that, in that crew, none whatsoever. Um, you know, referred to, uh, you know, Ross Atkins as a, as a clown. I, I thought it was a complete clown show, uh, what he did and how he threw John Schneider under the bus. Um, Shapiro came in, played the calm, cool, collected leader. By the way, don't know if you know this. He's uh, leading the uh, the uh, upgrades at the ballpark. So spent a lot of time talking about new seats and stuff like that. Um, talked about processes. Um, there's just no there's just no trust here. There's no trust. This organization, and I readily admit that I think you have to go for it in baseball. And if you get a chance, you go for it, but don't come and tell me, well, we made the playoffs for the last three years or three of the last four years. If you won any games in there, like uh, there is a complete disconnect between their achievements in their minds and what their fan base is saying. And I, I would have to say, uh, burn your tickets because there's no other way that they are so completely, uh, you know, not my observation. I believe it was Shai Davidi's ob observation, but, um, you know, yesterday, uh, uh, the Shapiro started throwing Donnie baseball's name in there. Don Mattingly thought this Don Mattingly thought, well, why, why would, of course, because everybody likes Don Mattingly. So you use Don Mattingly as the human shield in this. It's a mess. They, they 
they can't organize a two car parade. Um, they've gotten it to this point. Um, they should just give the keys to somebody else. Um, and I, and this is coming from a lifelong Expos fan. Like I have no, but what I can't stand is the exact point that I made on uh, Wednesday. It was, uh, the reason that I, I will not take Ross Atkins seriously as, as anything anymore is leadership. I'm a big leadership guy and part of leadership. Yes, it's is this these back and forth with the media. Steve Simmons was there yesterday. I, I the only thing I thought was hilarious was Shapiro calling Simmons on his crap. Are you asking a question, Steve, or are you making some statements? Well, I'm making some statements. Okay, I'll I'll respond to your statements. Thank you. Um, having said that, they just you get the sense, and I've seen this in hockey, I've seen this in football, I, I've seen it in baseball all the time, that the people in the inner circle with the teams look at everybody on the outside and go, well, they don't know. They're not us. They don't have the information. They don't have the experience. They're not real baseball people. They don't really know how everything works, which is all fine and well, except that you got to sell tickets and it's a business and people got to have trust and faith that you're going to do the right thing. And if you're going to walk this group back and expect everybody to purchase their season tickets and go, yeah, well, this time it'll be different. I don't know. I think it's dangerous. I think the flames have been too much the other way. I will readily admit that to use a local example. I think there's been way too much turnover uh, with the flames and coaching and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think nine years of this, of this show and just the debacle, it's inexcusable. And it's funny listening to different people comment on the Jays and, and you can see the Steve Phillips of the world and stuff are trying to be respectful and, and trying to, you know, he's been there before. He, you don't want to take a run at a guy doing a job and all that. I get that part. But there's Whit, uh, Mary Whitfield or uh, Mary Whitfield? Whit Maryfield? How about, we, how about we go with Whit Maryfield? Yeah. All right. Whit Maryfield's on another podcast today talking about what a disaster it was to let pull Berrios when they did. Um, I'm sorry. Whether you believe the criticism is justified against you, you need to deal with the criticism that is justified uh, against you. So um, we'll leave it at that. But I don't want to leave baseball. Jack, how about this? Every morning I wake up and pray at the altar of Jesse Cole, the owner and the founder of the Savannah Bananas. I think the Savannah Bananas are the greatest modern day incarnation of fun everywhere. Well, for next season, they have just introduced the golden batter rule. Now, this is pretty cool. So now your best hitter, once a game, once a game, you can take your best hitter and insert them wherever you want them, wherever you want them. And conceivably, much like Jonathan Taves in the World Juniors, conceivably could hit back-to-back, -back. could hit back-to-back. Now, is this coming to Major League Baseball anytime soon? No, it's not. But God bless the innovation and the, and the trying. So the golden batter rule coming to the, uh, and I don't know if, you, if you're, you're, nobody is, Rob. Don't dilute yourself. I'm assuming that everybody follows them the same way I do, and I don't think anybody does. They just held a draft of cities. They're playing at Fenway Park, but they drafted all the cities that they're going to with next year's tour. I believe they're adding a third team. Uh, if you have never spent any time around or watched the Savannah Bananas, do yourself a favor. Um, go see it. Uh, it's they, they have full games on YouTube. Uh, just invest some time in, in learning about it because I think it's really, really, really cool. And uh, yeah, and and they are having and they're having a little bit of success with that. So um, more so than than Mark Shapiro and Ross Atkins, I would say. Uh, clowns in both sides, sure but not having the, the same amount of success as one would hope. Um, and one other thing before we move back into hockey. Um, what's the second graphic I sent you this morning? It was on the something to do in Arizona. Thank you. I sure wrote it down. Um, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, Bali Sports walked away, walked away. Legally walked away, uh, got, a, got a court injunction, walked away from the contracts, will not be doing Diamonds back games, will not be doing uh, Coyotes games. I don't believe they're doing uh, uh, Suns games. This is what they sent out today. Bali Sports Arizona is no longer providing coverage of your favorite local teams. We sincerely thank you for your loyal viewership over the years. 
Good night, everybody. You can now watch the Coyotes if you have rabbit ears. But to, to actually say, hey, we're done. Good night. Ah, what a world we live in. All right. Speaking of what a world we live in, uh, we have the luxury of having a pretty awesome guest join us every second Friday. In this case, back-to-back Friday, he says. Our next guest brought to you by Ski Seller Snowboard. Um, Ski Seller Snowboard. Dot com 76 years in Calgary, four locations, two open right now, McLeod Trail by Chinook Center, Bow Ridge Road Northwest. Now, two more will open up. We'll get to those in a bit. But what you need to know is the latest snow skating is there. And if you, if you don't know what snow skating is, check that out on YouTube, kids. Uh, snowboards, skis are in. The best part, and I've said this before over and over and over again, and it's nothing against the box stores and it's nothing against, their, you know, the capitalism's amazing. But when you want to buy something, you want somebody selling it to you that knows what they're talking about and more often than not has actually used the product, that's Ski Seller Snowboard, skisellersnowboard.com. He's back live in studio. I gave him the right address, so I'm proud of that. Eric DeHatchuk from The Athletic joins us. Um, how are you? I'm good, and I found street parking. Oh, did the, you? For the first time in, what, two, two years? <laughs> yeah, <I was> <laughs> You bought about it. You should buy a lottery ticket because there's a lot of construction down there. Too, oh yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, and you said 1:30, and I think I got here on time. You were there's nothing. Absolutely everything about your appearance has been perfect so far. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, uh, listen, we we touched a little bit on it. Um, not uh, just want to talk about yesterday. Um, Chris Snow was remembered the service and then uh, a celebration of life afterwards. Um, I thought Brad Tree Living was was mm-hmm. brilliant. I, I wasn't able to attend. I, I went to the after event. I, I wasn't at the funeral. Um, I thought everybody, um, I thought it was awesome that Kevin Paul DuPont came from the Boston Globe to cover it. Um, what's, what's the legacy piece here? You know, like we, now that we've said goodbye, where will we see that, you know, Chris and his influence pop up on this team, on this league? Where, where, where will he live on? in in this game no that's a good question and and i was in the church in fact it was funny because uh when lisa and i came in we we went into a pew and we looked up and we were sitting beside jerome you know okay and on the other side of jerome was uh, mark wolleman who i work with at the athletic and he was the sports editor in minnesota that originally hired chris uh to, to to go and cover the wild and then tom thompson who was running yeah. the scouting department yeah. for doug risebrow uh, was there as well as Doug. And uh, I mean, just, you know, so many people made a real effort mm-hmm. to get to the actual funeral mass and, and to, to be there for four sensational uh, tributes or eulogies yeah. uh, uh, on, on behalf of, uh, of Chris. And, and the one thing that I learned yesterday that I didn't know was, um, and, and I've known Tom Thomas for a long time. He used to, he started out in the flames organization in the scouting department is, and he, and, and I've known this for a long time that he's, he's a big baseball guy. Mm-hmm. And so when, when he and Doug were there, it was, you know, like Tom originally said to Doug, you know, you should look at this guy because he's a really good baseball writer. And so it, it, that was a little bit of how Doug Ridesbrow became familiar with, yep. with, uh, with, with Chris Snow and, and his work. Uh, eventually, you know, Doug did hire him um, because, and I think it was mostly because he was a bright guy and an enthusiastic guy and wanted to work in the industry and was prepared to do whatever it took to to get into the industry. And um, as we all know that, you know, eventually when they cleaned house in, in Minnesota, Chris was without work for a year, wrote letters to all of the teams. Only Brian Burke and Jay Feaster responded. Jay eventually hired him brought him in here you know they created the analytics department and you know again part of the like it's a difficult question to to answer rob because everybody who has developed analytics on their own as opposed to you Mm -hmm. know what's out there publicly is is, you know there's a they have a sense of proprietary information right so they are they are not prepared to share the innovations that they are developing on their own uh they're prepared to tell you that that you know, the people that they're working for them are innovative and, and they're developing means of interpreting information mm-hmm. uh, that that be- they believe it gives them an edge or at the very least allows them to, to stay uh, on, on top of these, you know, technological developments that are happening in the business. So, you know, what will be his legacy? Well, you know, he is part of 
that first group of people that that came uh, into the the game and and asked tradition people who just yep. look at the game in traditional ways like like I do to look at it with a different perspective and i think that most people who believe that information is power will take that and so i i think that you know you sometimes you get into a discussion um you know you have people who are wholly committed to analytics on one side you have people who are wholly committed to the eye test on the other side mm -hmm. and and the reality is if, if you're doing the job right you take in all of the information and you digest it and, and then you try to come up with this rational uh a perspective as you can and i think that chris will be seen as someone uh in terms of, of the work that he did in hockey analytics as being part of that that pioneering group that um, you know that that forced people to to look at at the game with with a different set of eyes we you know the, the knee-jerk reaction sometimes is always well we we got to name something <laughs> is there enough work is there enough uh visible work that you know we we could honor an analytics person with a Chris Snow Award. Uh, we just went through this with the scouts, right? That, that, that they're doing something to sure. honor scouts. You spent all the years in, in you know, the Hockey Hall of Fame. You know how that works. Sure. Is, is it public enough now that you could have an award named after Chris to honor somebody in that field? Not now, I don't think, because okay. I think it's a, it's a field that is still developing. Yes. But I also think that if 20 years from now or 30 years from now, it has become... Um, it evolved and, and there will be a, a, a great number of people that will have worked in it and some will stand out more than others because that's the nature of any business or, uh, or enterprise that if there is eventually an award named for someone to honor work in analytics, it absolutely should be named for Chris Snow. And it's a brilliant idea by you. I hadn't thought about it before. Um, I, I don't see it happening imminently mm -hmm. uh, or even in the near term but but down the road absolutely you know the, i mean it took a long time for the national hockey league to decide that the top goal scorer in the league should be named after rocket richard right it, it, these things take time but yep. but i think in time uh, that is something that sh should happen and probably will the short-term legacy um my understanding is chris hired people there's no breakdown here. There's no, right. the work will be done. The right. projects will be done. The work continues. And he made sure of that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think we all know that, 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 that the one thing that Chris had that most sports writers don't have is an unbelievable work ethic. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and again, that's another reason why people on our side of the fence often don't cross over to the other side of the fence because, you know, those are long hours and long yeah. days. And, and it, it, it becomes a vocation as, as much as it is a job. It's more than a job. Uh, you know, Al Coates used to always say that, that, you know, when you choose a life in, in hockey, everyone in your life has to be on board with that because, sure. it, because it affects everybody all the time. It affects the amount of time you can spend taking your kids to, to games. It, it just, it, it, it can be overwhelming. It can also be very satisfying, but you have to have the right personality and the right support group uh, to make it work. And so, um, so yeah, <laughs> I, I was, I was transitioned now to the start of the season. I, I was reading the notebook today and, uh, I, I was railing a little bit about, you know, I, not, not your column, but I, I thought that, you know, as I was watching two screening, the, the Calgary game, you know, they're ahead two one, but I don't know how, look at this heat map, right. you know, they're, Oh, Mark, if it wasn't for Mark, it was all the yeah, buts. Yeah, yeah. And to me, watching the Calgary Flames, they just, they're, they're thinking yeah. they're, they're not, they're not, in, they're not into the system yet. Yeah. That, that everything else was a good sign. Yeah. Um, overreactions though, Edmonton eight, one loss. Wow. Oh, that, well, I have to say that one, like I kept waiting for, you know, for them to turn it around. I, I kept waiting, waiting for a punchline. <laughs> yeah, I kept waiting for the, the moment where, you know, McDavid and dry sees the game back because they have the ability to Absolutely. do that and it didn't happen. And, and I have to say the problem, of course, is that game was going on at the same time as the sure. Calgary game. And the yeah. Calgary game was more interesting, but just because as the score mount, <laughs> I have to say, I kept switching over yeah. to see what was going on. And uh, to the point that, well, you, you referenced my, my notes column today, yeah. I, I contacted the, the people I know at, at, at NHL Stats, and I said, 
has this ever happened before? Because, you know, two days before puck drop, if you looked at everybody's predictions or, or yeah. guesses or whatever you want to call them for the start of the season, there were an awful lot of people that had the Edmonton Oilers as a, as a Stanley Cup contender. We were so, talking about it here last Friday. Okay. We, right? yeah. so, so, again, I went to my friends at NHL. I said, has anyone ever lost a the first game of the season, 8-1 and won the Stanley Cup. And the answer is no, it has never happened before in NHL history. The closest, and this was only just a few years ago, but when St. Louis had that poor start to the mm -hmm. first half of the season, they had a poor start to the season and they got spanked. I went back and looked at the box score. They lost 5-1 to Winnipeg and it wasn't close. And they were, they did not look good. And they didn't really look good for the first half of the season. And they ended up celebrating with the Stanley Cup. And there have been sure. other teams that have lost, you know, by three goals and, and you know, and, and and came out flat mm -hmm. and and i think that you know the collective answer there is that a lot there are a lot of imperfect beginnings in the national hockey league that that still can end with somebody celebrating the cup but it's funny you should mention that because mark specter was at that uh, the memorial service for for chris snow mark works at, at sportsnet yeah. now and and we both had the same idea that like I, I was going in a different direction with my notes column and I felt I had to pivot to that if only to get it on the record as this is the starting point, just in case at the end of the season, they are talking about Edmonton as a team that, that has won the Stanley cup so that we would have it in our minds that this is how it yep. began. And yep. then, and then how did you navigate that path through the remaining 81 games and through the playoffs to actually get to the winner's circle. And if the season, it, it, you can, it works both ways, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately on our side of the fence, or if the, the ending is as disappointing as it has been the last couple of years, you can say it began this way mm -hmm. and it ended this way and, and it comes full circle. So again, that's part of what, we do in the writing yeah, game you, yeah. you you want to establish uh, these benchmarks or parameters early on but um so i didn't see enough of the game to know what went wrong however i i do know that i don't think they can win without matias at home and i'm not sure even if they have at home back at full strength playing the role that he played on the team after he came over in the trade deadline if that defense is still good enough and mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's fair to say it's only one game jack campbell had a terrific preseason you know saturday night the, there's a rematch and the oilers could very easily exact revenge on on vancouver and and then all will be forgotten and all will be forgiven but the goaltending looked uh, nervous and 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 not good enough and so we'll see one of those two needs to be better yeah and then you know when they get to the playoffs if it's still those two and i suspect that it will be for a lot of reasons including salary cap considerations somebody has to step up and 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 be aiden hill because if somebody steps up from that group and, and is mm -hmm. aiden hill then then everything is fine but you, ne you know you, you you know those types of of fairy tale storylines um that vegas had with their goaltending in the playoffs that's it doesn't happen that often no. and so um you know to you uh, basically you're crossing your fingers and you're hoping that you catch lightning in a bottle in the same way that vegas did with the number of goaltenders that they had uh you know patrolling the crease and the, su the success that they had with with a lot of different people between the pipes well i, I gotta be honest with you uh, to me it was like oh, all right they lost they won so what you know they'll be fine and then i read the call and i'm like oh and you brought data um <laughs> like i I got to be honest with you. I would have swore somebody in the 80s yeah. would have had that happen to yeah. them. I think of all those Chicago Ed Cow or Edmonton games, you know, the ones that would end up ridiculously sure. yeah. high. That's, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what I thought, too. That that was the whole point of yeah. reaching out to uh, because I don't have that database, but obviously they do. And uh, and and I was surprised at that yeah. result. But that is why you 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 crunch those but, but numbers. But even, even you because you went the seven goals down to the five goals down to the what? Like getting blown out is, you know, even four goals is, you know, quite audacious to come back from, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but, but the other thing I would say too is, Robin, and I think this is to the, the point that you mm -hmm. were, were making there is that if that had happened in game 39, it, it, it would be like a mild curiosity for a few hours and then oh, we'll yeah. move on. Yeah. The problem is that there is such a focus on the home opener and the beginning that yeah. people, you know, rush to snap judgments right away. And, and we all have to collectively take a step back and say, okay, it was just one game. And, and especially at the start of the season when, 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 
you know, I mean, it, it's not that the NHL preseason is as insignificant as the NFL preseason because nothing can be more insignificant than the, the NFL preseason. I mean, the stars don't even play yeah, in exactly. those games. Yeah. Nevertheless, you know, there is a diff- different level of, um, of, of competition, sure. of pace, uh, of, of competitiveness. And if you've, you know, kind of coasted through the, the exhibition season, it's hard to just turn it on and, and be, you know, mid season ready and, and veteran players know that, you know, over the course of, you know, three to five to seven to, to 10 days, they're ramping it up and, and, and it's a marathon. So they have to be ready to play 82 games. So, um, you know, like as I say, I I I, t- I try not to rush to judgment, yeah. but I just thought that that was so unusual to lose in such a decisive way. Yes, that that it felt wor- I, it felt I, it was worth pointing out. Yeah, and there, I won't lie to you. Part of me was wondering if it was the hockey gods punishing uh, Woodcroft. You don't play games with your goalies. Like, I, what, where was that coming from? Well, I'm not going to tell you who my goalie is. Yeah, yeah. Come on now, like yeah. that's not who that guy is. No. No, no, exactly. And, and there is a part of me, I, I'm, I'm too old school, you know, as, as well as Jack Campbell played in the exhibition season, you know, I'm, I'm pleased about that. I think now I have an option, but I, then I also think about what Stuart Skinner did for me and saved my season he did. last he year did. because and he's when, your future and he is your future that he gets the start. Yeah. And then if you have to come back with, uh, you know, Jack Campbell in the home open, you come back with them, but that whole, you know, issue of, of goaltending, uh, um, rotation is mm-hmm. going to be interesting this year because I, I you know I, I think more and more teams now realize that that you don't want to burn out your starter and you can burn out your starter and if you have a reliable 1b you know get him in there even if you know uh you know somebody is, is off to a good start uh, you know you you want to see both guys in there and you want to get them both going in the right direction I mean I think about you know one of the uh, you know, the, the games that probably people didn't pay a lot of attention to last night was St. Louis, Dallas. And I stayed with that longer than, than I intended to partly because St. Louis was hanging in really, really well against mm-hmm. them. And, but if you watch that game and I, I guess I saw most of it. The one thing that struck me was Jordan Bennington looked pretty good. You know, so if you look at all of the, you know, the, the, the discussion at the start of the year, you know, they have a young goaltender coming up, Joel Hoffer. I think yep. that's how you pronounce it. Um, that he might even wrest the job away from Bennington this year because he's been apprenticing in the minors and he's ready to go and, and everyone thinks he's going to be terrific. Well, you know, that was a statement game from Bennington because he was excellent, excellent against the the Stars. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, how they deploy their goaltending because a lot of people don't give... St. Louis much of a chance this year to even make the playoffs, let alone make any kind of noise. Where do you come down on Biddington and the not so stuff? You know, like he, he has this ability to lose his mind and get crazy and want to fight everybody. Yeah. So we, Ed, Ed Belfer, that's what I, th- I, I immediately or, think of Ed Belfer who Ed Belfer or Ronnie Hextall. Well, both, but, but, but Belfer for sure. And, and Belfer's in the hall of fame. And so but he grew out of it, didn't he? Mm, I don't know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm think try, I'm trying to, rem- I mean, not certainly not with police officers that I know. Yeah. yeah. But, um, well, uh, I just know I'm, I'll never forget, you know, asking Gary Souter about uh, him one time when yeah. they were both with St. Louis. And it's like, we just don't go near him on game day. You okay. know, he's just in his own, in his own world. And, uh, uh, I mean, I think the bottom line there is if, if you, if you get results, then yep. you can live with, with that. Um, and, and if you don't, then, you know, then you're going to be out well, of the it's, If you lose, it's an idiosyncrasy. And if you win, it's character, right? He's a character. <laughs> That's a good way of putting yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I talked a little bit about the, the, the flames briefly, but I do want to talk about Winnipeg because they, you know, Kevin shovel day off to his credit. You don't surprise the media very often yeah. surprise the media uh, with the announcement of, of, you know, twin contracts for Shifley and, and Connor Hellebuck. I don't think we know how important, uh, sorry. I don't think we can, stress how important that was for that organization right yeah. like that was a really big move yeah 100 percent. and actually i saw kevin at uh, kevin stayed over and attended the the funeral mass for chris yesterday and we had a chance to chat for a couple of minutes and, and i'll tell you what i told him i i said i first of all i was impressed with how well they played mm-hmm. um you know to me that was a team that at the end of last year you wondered you know like it felt like a team divided it felt like there were issues in the dressing room it felt like that there was something more going on there to take this team that on paper looked very talented and, and was underachieving and and that 
we didn't see that mm -hmm. last night or on, the, on opening night. We saw a team that, that seemed to be on the same page, played very hard, probably deserved a better fate if, if Markstrom hadn't been as good as, as he was. So, But then, we yeah, we got to the, the point about Shifley and, and Hellebuck and, and signing those contracts. And, you know, I, I really do believe that, that nowadays, if you're running Winnipeg, Calgary, Buffalo, Ottawa, one of the most important things you have to be as a manager is a salesman. You know, so, yep. you know, like I'd be watching, you know, Mad Men reruns and, and figuring out how to, you know, how to get these <laughs> ad campaigns going to to convince the players that this is where they need to be. And I think he did a really good job there. I mean, I think he, you know, he he actually said it out loud at, at, at the press conference that they shared a lot more information with the, the long term plan of the organization and how those players fit in than they normally would um you know in the old days of mm -hmm. negotiation uh, how, how how would i tell you so i i'm a general manager you know you're my star player rob you know in the old days i would show you how much i cared about you by saying we're offering you seven years and yeah. x a million dollars and and I, you wouldn't occur to me to say and it, the reason is because we think you're a great player and you're a great person and you bring all these things to the mix and and you know it, it would be enough to say you know we 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 want you because we're prepared to pay you this amount of money. Well, that is no longer enough. Mm -hmm. Now you have to be able to, to, to say to them, this is our vision as an organization. This is our vision in the community. This is where we think you fit in. And by the way, we appreciate everything you've done for us so far. And, and we think you can continue to do that. And it's crazy to think that even high priced athletes uh, who are used to a lot of adulation still need to hear that from their bosses. And, and I think that that's how that workplace is, is no different than any other workplace. Once it, and it costs you nothing. That, that's the part that gets me. Yeah. You know, like you can think that it, it, it costs you nothing to say it out loud. And I think that some of these managers, because if you look, the four cities that I mentioned, those are all of the, yep. the so-called small market teams in the so-called winter climates where you have to do more than just, you know, sign and sign a guy and Buffalo sign. They're two guys. Ottawa signed four or five guys. Winnipeg now has a couple of guys. Uh, Calgary was able to, to say to Michael Backlund, we value what you've mm -hmm. done and we see you as being part of the future and we think you're the captain of our team and we really want you to stay. And Backlund digested that message and that information and signed the contract extension. So I, I think there's a, a real correlation between all those cities and all the approaches that they're using to convince players that that's where they should be long-term. I am, I guess it's age now, but I'm beginning to understand. I, I always thought things were black and white and, and had a start and had a, a finish. I'm beginning to understand that this is the, the relationship between player team and management is always evolving is going to always evolve. I go back to, you know, 10 years ago, we were going, geez, you know, the player's different now. Oh, yeah, the player, you have to talk to him. You used to be able to tell him to go through the wall. Uh -huh. Now you have to tell him what's in it for him to go through the wall. Uh -huh. And this is a baseball thing, but when I'm hearing you talk about, you know, Kevin Sheveldayoff having to explain to these guys where they're going, what they're doing, the Jays, like that loss and pulling out uh, Barrios, that seems to be the number one issue in Toronto right now is how do you explain to the players mm -hmm. your process, how we're making, yep. these are the way we're making decisions. This is why we're making the decisions. The players have to understand and, and buy into the process. It's changing, Eric. They're not just automata, automatons or my cat. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I can't say that word either, by but the way. They're just not, robots. <laughs> they're just not exactly. bodies that you throw out on the ice anymore. They've got to be part of the solutions. Yeah, exactly. Too. And, and, you know, again, you're using that baseball analogy and, and I'm a, a, a very fair weather baseball fan. Sure. So I pay attention now, but, but I don't through the course of the season, but, but I, I just know that anybody that's at that level and is a competitive athlete. Sure. If it's, if the analytics are telling me, pull the pitcher in, in game 59. I'm doing that because it's game 59. I have 162 game schedule and I want to make sure that he doesn't have a dead arm by the end of the playoffs. Yep. But now, where are we? We are in this critical right. wild card game and 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 this is when I stop paying attention to analytics. And if my guy tells me he can go, right. then then he can go. I mean, I I was I started being a baseball fan in 1967. I was a Detroit Tigers fan because my aunt and uncle visited Detroit and brought me back a T-shirt. And I watched Mickey Lolich win three games in that World Series. Denny McLean won the other one against <laughs> the St. Louis Cardinals. And and I'm sure he had a tired arm afterwards. But right. who cares? They won the World Series. The athlete isn't going to pull himself 
there are special circumstances that tell you to go beyond what the numbers yeah. are suggesting. And in that particular case, someone, I think, just made the wrong call that they just sure they just decided to rely 100 percent on the data and and this is a flesh and blood sport and you know and and these are flesh and blood athletes and and their drive for the most part anyways is off the charts in that situation you know you let him pitch but but, but can you imagine telling scotty bowman or al arbor or glenn say there oh. geez you got to go explain to the players why we did that right <laughs> Well, not Scotty Bowman in his prime, you know, <laughs> no, no. grandfather Scotty Bowman, who, you know, sure. who calls everybody back. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he, he might even understand that. Well, I, I remember doing a piece with Scotty a, a while ago about uh, the evolution of coaching. And one of the things he said, just as a side, yeah, some of the stuff you did, you wonder sometimes about it, you know? So oh, yeah. I don't know that he's necessarily, you know, rehashing everything, but, uh, but yeah. He but it's changed. To, he, it's changed that to your point. Yes, it has changed. And, and it, it I don't think that that's a, a method that would work today. It just simply wouldn't. I am st somewhat stunned, and maybe it's the Calgary in me coming out, that Connor Hellebuck signed. Yeah. The American stud goalie that could write the check, mm -hmm. that there's still enough organizations out there that believe you got to have the number one, mm -hmm. that he could have gone into free agency. He gave up money. Yeah, uh, well, th that I'm not 100% sure about, Rob. Because oh, really? I, well, only because I think the goaltending market is um, is softening. I, I think that one of the things that I'm okay. I'm gathering again, you know, I talk to managers, yeah, yeah, and um, and I think that a lot of them are looking at that position a little bit more critically mm. in terms of compensation, and then partly it's because you know last year the backup to the backup to the backup won a Stanley Cup yep. in Vegas, yep. and the year before. A, a guy that Colorado brought in because they they lost Philip Grubar unexpectedly to Seattle in the expansion draft and were scrambling to get a goaltender got them over the top and 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 no one paid a lot of money to either of these guys okay. and and the goaltenders that were on long term contracts some of them were were earning their money and and others were you know missing the playoffs or or losing in, in the first round. So, you know, the whole idea, I, I think the comparable in, in the larger world of sport is how the NFL has has changed its approach to running backs. I was just going to ask you about okay, that. This so is the same thing, isn't it? It, it, it seems to me that, yeah. that it's still in the early, in early stages in, in terms of, of how hockey is treating goaltenders, but because every year, you know, somebody comes out of nowhere and and becomes the flavor of the month, and somebody else who's had a, a a very solid career, you know, that falls off a cliff, and they're up and they're down, they're up and they're down. And so, how much money mm -hmm. can you actually commit to a goaltender? I think people are looking at that Carey Price contract and thinking, yeah, that's going to be an albatross on yeah. Montreal's payroll for for a long period of time. Even someone like John Gibson in Anaheim, who's a good goaltender on on a bad team, you know, I think there are some thoughts that you know that maybe it's time to turn it over to, to Lucas Dossel so as it applies to to Connor Hellebuck yeah it's possible that you know that Buffalo might have looked at him as a free agent if Devon Levy doesn't work mm -hmm. out but I think they're committed to uh to him and especially with the dollars they've now committed to those two young defensemen they're they are not going to have an unlimited um, amount of money to to throw at a free agent if you look at New Jersey Gave Timo Meyer a lot of money. You know, Hughes and, and Heshire are signed. Eventually, the the tap is going to run dry there. That would have been another possibility for Hellebuck. And then, and then after that, you know, you you pretty much start to run out of people that are going to pay him eight five over seven years, right? So it's just under sixty million dollars. So I think I think money, so the agent actually might have done really good work here. Well, I think the agent the agents. The good agents are the ones that that recognize how a marketplace changes right. and evolves and try to get out in front of it. Right. And and I think there are some agents that don't do that. And so the agents that say, you know, well, this guy got this, so therefore my guy gets that. Uh, you know, like that that negotiating strategy doesn't work no. anymore all the time. And so I do think that. Um, and and the other thing is the age of these players, right? So again, look at the, mm -hmm. the biggest trend in hockey right now is even before Owen Power gets out of his entry level contract, the the eight year extension is is in place. So now you're wrapping, you're getting this guy for essentially the prime of his career. As you are gambling, you are anticipating that he's going to become what you think he's going to become. But rather than give the money to a player who's 29 
and give them the seven or eight year contract. And now he's 37. More and more teams are trying to give it to a player earlier in his career so that they're, they are buying the prime years of their career. And I think that, you know, that, that, that as it relates to Mark Shifley, it's the same thing. You know, if, if he got to free agency next year, I'm sure the Boston Bruins would have been interested. Any number of teams would have been interested, but maybe at five years a five-year term and maybe at a slightly smaller number. And there was almost 60 million guaranteed dollars on the table. And, you know, he probably signed an under market contract uh, in his last contract. And and this was an opportunity to, to, you know, finish out his career in, in Winnipeg. I think, you know, I, I've talked to him a few times over the years and I had a very long profile of him early on in my years at the athletic when he was our Winnipeg athlete of the year. And the one thing that always struck me is that he's a hockey nerd. Yeah. yeah. So he's a hockey nerd. And, and I think it helps to be a hockey nerd when you're in a hockey obsessed city like Winnipeg, like he's a really good fit there. Like, you know, he, you know, on his nights off, he's watching hockey games, you know, mm -hmm. not every current NHL player is that committed. A lot of them on their nights when they're not playing are not watching hockey. They're trying to get away from the game. So I think that, uh, you know, you have to have a certain personality, I believe, to um, to want to play in a in a hockey crazed market. And so, if you have somebody like that, you know, if, if there's a way of getting him to commit and stay and and uh, you know keep your team on track, because they're 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 a good team, right? They're a good team. Yeah. I don't know if they're a great team, but you know, other than they're a hot streak by Hellebuck for going deep. Yeah. That, that that's what I think. I, you know, again, we're, you know, we're trying to forecast, yeah. you know, this team, that team, this team, that team, no one looks bulletproof to me. Like, no, like wh wh what is the best team in the NHL? You know, if you, if you want to say Carolina, I can tell you exactly why Carolina is not good. I can give you better reasons why 32 teams aren't going to win a Stanley cup than I can argue the other thing, why a team should win a Stanley cup, because everybody's got flaws. Everybody's got holes. It's partly the function of the financial system that that we're in, that you know you have to patch and 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 hope and stay healthy and and there's just a whole bunch of intangibles that that enter into it. So, but if you're trying to make the case for Winnipeg, I like their top six. You know, Josh Morrissey is he a true number one? I think he is. You know, like if you know a lot of people might argue otherwise, but how does he defend? Like he, he, to me, he defends at a capable level. Yep. Yeah. And and he's ter terrific offensively and yeah. I, 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 runs a quarter, runs a power play. Somebody, I, I think it was Brad Tree Living, but one of the managers I talked to once. Uh, oh, you know what? Actually, I think this was Craig, a, a conversation I had with Craig Button about what constitutes a true number one defenseman. Mm. And Craig's point was there are 32 teams in the National Hockey League, so therefore there must be 32 number one defensemen. Now, you know, you might argue that you know there are some teams that have two number ones and some teams that have zero, but mm -hmm. but if if you if you simply uh, analyze it from the most basic term the you know the number one defenseman is the best defenseman on your team there's 32 of them well if there's 32 number one defensemen in the national hockey there's no doubt in my mind that josh morrissey is a number one defenseman no doubt in my mind so yeah. so i like their defense as you point out you know hellebuck top you know i think for now anyway one of the top five goalies in the league and everybody can fill in you know the the bottom half of their roster with young players and and veterans and you know there's not a lot to choose from uh you know among most teams when it comes to the the depth players and, and the five and six defensemen so there's there's enough pieces there to to suggest they could be in the playoffs and is, then pff, who knows is kind of we were talking about this before you got here i i to me kyle connor's the the most underrated player in the in the nhl that he scores. He's an X factor. Well, I th I think he's like a really good offensive player. You know, sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think that there's some deficiencies in in the in in the f the completeness of, of his game. But yeah, he's he's really skilled and and he finds the holes and, uh, you know, he's. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you know, I've had him on my fantasy team. I don't have him this year, and I'm really oh. mad about that. <laughs> I don't know how I let him go. Well, he always plays well in the first game, right? Well, he, and, and he's always done pretty well for me. He's just a reliable guy. Sure. And, and and to the other to to your point, I mean, he's he's he, he's an American that signed long term to stay in Winnipeg. You know, so a bit, like, a, a bit like uh, a bit like Hellebuck and. Uh, I think that, you know, in the same way that when Alex Dabrinkit left Ottawa to go to Detroit, I think the feeling was that he wanted to go home. He basically said that. Well, I think a lot of people thought that that would happen previously with with Kyle Connor because he's also from that Michigan area. And, and instead, he he signed long-term with Winnipeg. So that's, 
just you know, again, everybody is different and everyone has different goals and aspirations. Can you give me a little historical context? I'm taking you back to the Owen Power signing. Mm -hmm. The the general belief was the lockout in 2012-13 was a result of Doug McLean signing Rick Nash right. yeah. to the second contract. Right. And that so that caused a lockout. And yet yesterday well, it Buffalo contributed to a lockout. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. But yesterday Buffalo made a a call that I think we all go, oh, that's that's just good business. Well, yeah, and and I, you know, and to me, it 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 didn't start to change then. It started to change when when Ottawa gave Thomas Shabbat eight years at a point where, you know, Shabbat was like Owen Power was the first overall pick, and you know, yeah, a lot of yeah, people yeah. think a potential future Norris Trophy winner Shabbat was, I think, 18th overall mm -hmm. and a, a good player. Uh, but I think that Ottawa at that time anticipated that. You know that if they have these good young players, they need to show them love right away, and um, and and so they signed with that kind. I, I remember that created quite a stir. It's like, mm -hmm. are you kidding? You know, because you know, as you say, as soon as uh, someone establishes what an agent will say is a precedent, then you know everybody's got a client that fits mostly the same bill, and they sure. want the same deal, and not every team believes in that. But yeah, no, I mean, you're right. It it goes back to that. The thing we were talking about just a few minutes ago that teams have said, I would rather pay for their prime years mm -hmm. than to have to, you know, nickel and dime them in the in the early years when when the leverage, the negotiating leverage is more with the teams. And then, you know, it comes to roost at the point where they're 26 and now they want a, an eight year term. And, and now you're paying for years where they're they're probably going to be overpaid and and the contract becomes an albatross at the end of it. So people are still trying to figure out the. Uh, you know, the, the ins and outs of the salary cap. I also think, again, if you talk to the managers, uh, if you turn the clock back three or four years, like everybody projects the rosters going forward, yep. right? Rob? Yep. And so, and the one thing they'll tell you, and, and they'll say it on the record, that we didn't anticipate that in the four or five years that have passed that the cap has gone up four or five million dollars. I, 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 Kenny Holland said that at the, at the draft to a, a number of us that were standing around, that that was the one thing. If you told him when he took over the Oilers that in that time that he has been running the Oilers, the cap would, would inch up in these tiny, tiny, small increments, you know, maybe they would have done business differently, but they didn't anticipate that. And that was, you know, the result of a pandemic and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the, the escrow payments that had to be repaid by the players to the, to the league to keep that 50, 50 balance in place. And so it, it has forced teams to, to, shift on the fly how they operate and i think that every every manager you talk to now will tell you there's an inflection point next summer because the cap's going to go up three or four million and there's another inflection point the summer after that and they think that there'll be 10 more million dollars in the system by the summer of 2025 and that will create a little bit of breathing room for all the teams that are so tight up against the cap right now and then we'll see what happens after that this conversation here is the whole reason why i've always loved you as a guest <laughs> because i always come away no no I mean this, the, the quarterback or the running back goalie, that pops for me. Yeah, You know, it really does because it, you've seen it in the NFL, right? That used to be the premier player. That's sure. where all the money went. Yeah, And now your, your point about the, uh, the, the goalies are great. So does that mean then, cause it's not always exactly the same, but are skill centermen and number one defenseman, are they going to be the quarterbacks? Are they going to be, is that where? Or the, the ace, you know, cornerback or you know, or the yeah. middle linebacker that calls the defense. Yeah. You know, where you actually allocate. Where you yours. make your money. Well, I, I do think so, especially number one centers. You yeah. Know? But but that, and, and what I would tell you is that, you know, for as long as I've been covering hockey, which is a long time, teams still, you know, if you had a number one center, you hung on to the number one center. If you yeah. didn't have one, it was like, where am I going to get one? Yeah. Right. And so, so once in a great while, you know, and this is what happened with Jack Eichel, someone that is in most people's minds, the number one center in this particular case with an injury history and, and some baggage attached is available. Now, how aggressive are you as a team that is going to be bidding on Jack Eichel prepared to be? And so, I mean, Vegas, which is a team that's in on everyone was the most aggressive and they got him and paid off in a championship. Yep. So, um, you know, that just reinforces the point that if you don't have them and Vegas didn't, they went out and got them. And then all of a sudden now William Carlson can play down the depth chart and he's a very, very good player for you. Uh, but Eichel is your, they're is, slotted is, right now. Yeah. 
exactly right? and that and that's the key so um so yes those are the players that are going to be getting you know the big dollars uh, speaking of slot how good was that banner raising uh for vegas pulling the slot oh. machine that that was fantastic yeah, I, I mean, you know, they've they've been putting on a show oh, since they came into the league. Even right? the rings are show. Yeah, I like, know. Yeah. Like the ring is the, with the arena and the I nine know. goals. It's amazing. There is a part of me that is. Eh. <laughs> I'm a killjoy sometimes. No, no, but, goes, that's true. Uh, I am. No, yeah. no, no. Uh, yeah, but well, I, I get it. Like yeah. I. Oh, I mean, it's a completely different conversation today <laughs> than 20 years ago. Like, oh my God, 20 years ago we would have beaten the. Oh my God, you can't do that. No, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Send those back to Jostens. Order new rings, regular rings, please. Yeah. yeah but I, I did enjoy the the slot machine thing. Yeah, see, you're way more modern than I. Uh, am. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. That's often people refer to me that way. You're so modern. Um, I made a big mistake last week, uh -oh. and you called me on it, uh -oh. and it's really kind of set me into a converse. So we were talking about generational players, and I threw dry sidle out there. You said, "Oh, wait a minute." Kid started the American Hockey League. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. He did. I. And I got thinking, okay, so hold on a minute here. Generational player, what does that mean? Like once in a generation. How many generational players are do we have right now? And are we using the right terms? Is let me ask you this. Is Austin Matthews a generational player? Mm, right on the, the cusp. I, to okay. Me, okay, so to me, Sidney Crosby is a generational yes, player. Agree. Right? Connor McDavid is a generational agreed. player. Eichel, not yet. Okay. A lot of people thought he could be Matthews. <sighs> yes, I I I I think I think Austin Matthews will be, is, and then Connor Bedard. So four, you know. So so our generation has four. <laughs> well, but but th that goes back to two thousand and five. That's so, fair enough. Yeah, fair right, enough. So okay. in, in an eighteen year span, we have one generational player whose career is winding down. We have one generational player whose career is two games in, mm -hmm. and then we have two in the middle of that. McDavid and 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 I. Matthews is, is a really tough one. I, I you know, haven't really thought about it. But the, so the way he scores... See, I know. Ovechkin is going to be the leading goal scorer of all time. Kane? Taves? No, no. They won championships, for sure. But but in terms of, you know, what Wayne Gretzky did. Were, what, bro, were what, Brodeur and Waugh generational players? I, I don't have a single goaltender on my list of generational okay, okay. players. But, but I think Wayne Gretzky. I think Mario Lemieux. Yes. Yager? See, see, Yager and Matthews to me are the same guy. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right? Because they're not normal. No. But there's somebody better than them. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I and 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 you know, the the, the Ovechkin won all those guys. There's some there, there's there's one I, I can't explain why I have Crosby as a generational player and not Ovechkin because Ovechkin will eventually have the goal scoring lead. I have a theory about that. Well, is it because he does that one thing really well and nothing else? No. Okay. So I I it's the flip side of that. By the way, Lindros's name hasn't come up in this conversation. Too. No, he was supposed to be he a was generational supposed to, and player. And was he not for like three seasons? Five. Yeah. Five seasons. I, I think for the first five years of his career, if he had been able to to continue right. that for a length of time, he would be somebody we'd be talking about. So let me, so this is why I think Crosby's generational and Ovechkin might not be in this case. Gretzky came in and he just did things and put up point totals that we'd never seen. Right. Lemieux came in, almost did that, but in a bigger frame with a different speed and a dip, but different skill set. Different skill set. Crosby to me is the first blue collar generational player Interesting. put up yeah. points yeah. but would would battle you in the corner mm -hmm. was really good in small tight areas mm -hmm. did the things that, mm -hmm. that took to get the puck he didn't need he did he had other players that would go get the puck but he was capable of doing it himself yeah so i just thought he defined himself as kind of the first lunch bucket generational player yeah that's well said i like that yeah i like that and the thing about ovechkin again you know he does that one thing really really well Right. But yes. does, does he, you know, the term people use, does he drive play? Does he drive play? Like when he's on the ice, I, I get to stick more than, than Alex Ovechkin does. I, I guess it really is as simple as that. You know, the puck is on his stick and it's off his stick and it's in the net. And that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for, but he just doesn't seem to 
to be that guy that that drives the play and catches your eye whenever he's on the ice. And he he's more, like Patrick Kane is that other guy too. Or Brett Hull was like that. You know, like he, you know, he wouldn't be in the frame your frame of vision. He wouldn't be in your frame of vision. You wouldn't see him, and all of a sudden he materializes. The pucks on his stick, it's in the net. Mm-hmm. So again, we're talking about very productive mm-hmm. Hall of Fame players, or in Ovechkin's case, Ovechkin's case, a future Hall of Famer. But you know, you're talking about generational players. Yes, and, and that shouldn't. That's not the same as star, superstar or, or other no. terms that we use to apply. We talk about somebody that that comes along every once in a great while, and and changes the the nature of the game. And and again, yeah. you know, we're we're two games into Connor Bedard, and it, and and you know, I think everyone will say so far so good. You know, you watch him, and it's like, wow, this guy's going to be special. But you know, a year into the Eric Lindros era it was like wow this guy is really different absolutely you know, and he came in he was a big man that was skilled and ran people over again he, he was he was redefining the game mark messier was one thing and lindros was going to take what messier did in his prime and, and take it one step further and for for a fairly short period of time he did and then the concussions came and mm-hmm. and for you know most of his career uh, and certainly in terms of the years that he played he was he was a very average player and well, so we, that doesn't make someone a generational player how would we have viewed because Steve Eiserman, to me, not necessarily in this conversation, is, is really close to it, sure. But he's always going to be known as the guy that gave up the points to win, right? That what if he didn't? What if he just went out and scored? Because he scored him in buckets. I don't know if people remember that. But his first couple of years, mm-hmm. like he 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 was really, really offensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then and changed and evolved. But, you know, what? again, we're we're talking about all great players but you know joe sakic eiserman you know yeah there's another one i, I right? mean i you know i think when we had to rank the the, the you know the top 100 players I, I think i might have had a, a sakic ahead of eiserman in terms of my all-time list other people would obviously disagree but but you know there were that's but that's a level below what gretzky did when he came in yes. what lemieux did <laughs> through the arc of his career what yes. crosby has done through the arc of his career and uh is this the most generational players we've had in the league at one time? Well, Gretzky and Lemieux overlap for yes. a, a fair number of years. Lindros would have overlapped with both of them, mm-hmm. but we've already determined that, that didn't work yeah, out. Yeah, then there was. But if you had asked me that question in Lindros's third year, we would have probably identified three generational players at that time too. Yeah. So, and again, we're at that point where one career is winding down and another is starting. And and to say, you know, we we anticipate that Connor Bedard is going to be a generational player, but only time will tell you know he has to stay healthy you know he has to go through the various you know the, uh, steps in in terms of becoming you know a, a top player in, in in the league and uh and a difference maker you know and someone that sets himself apart from everyone else and he won't do that this year this year he'll he'll be a really good nhl player and next year he'll probably be a really good nhl player and then we'll see where where it goes from there now that you have done your term on in the hockey hall of fame looking back or knowing what you know should there be a first ballot or pen uh, Deion sanders brought this up in football this week there needs to be a penthouse and then a hall of fame mm-hmm. should there be a designation for a, a a gretzky who my god if we could have moved the clock ahead we would have put him in as soon as you know is there value to that or, or is that maybe taking away then the the inherent debate that comes with these conversations yeah. Well, no, that's a great point. I mean, Gretzky did the, the Hall of Fame. I think he was the last player they did it for. But yeah. when he became eligible, instead of making him wait three years, they waived the three-year waiting period Correct. and allowed him to go in. And I think he was the only player. That was before I was on the okay. on the selection committee. But uh, And then I think why they changed that was because um, you know, Mary Lemieux was elected to the Hall of Fame and then unretired and came back. And so I think they decided that they wanted to make sure that somebody was – you know, fully retired. That's it's why I mean, Yaramir Yager hasn't played in the NHL for a long period of time. And he's still three years away from being a Hall of Famer because he continues to, to go out and, and, and play games in, in Kladno. And, and that was the case with Dominic Hasek for years. He would have been elected much sooner yeah. if he hadn't had that. Been active. You know, the, the, yeah, those yeah. The, the games at the end of his career, Pavel Datsuk, um, you know, playing in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know. that. I hadn't, I hadn't actually heard that that concept before, um, and and I don't I I don't know how you would do that. I, I don't know how you would do that. Um, I mean, the one the, when it comes to the Hockey Hall of Fame, the one thing that I've always believed 
is that like the, the categories are very specific. Mm -hmm. So you either get in as a player or as a builder. Mm -hmm. And and there's a lot of people whose careers who who contributed to the game of hockey sure. as a player and as a, a manager, you know, scout or whatever, who had uh, long careers and and they don't specifically meet the Hall of Fame standard as a player and they don't specifically meet it as a builder. So they're on the outside looking in. For the longest time, that was Doug Wilson. Now he eventually got in as a player. But people would come up to me and say, why isn't Doug Wilson in the Hall of Fame? And I said, well, are you talking about what he what he did, you know, building the San Jose Sharks as the original manager or, mm -hmm. or you know, one of the or the original captain and then eventually the longtime manager there or as a player. And they said, well, both. I said, well, that, but that's not how our elections work. You mm -hmm. know, we either have to assess his playing career in and of itself or his management career in and of itself, but we can't merge the two. So my solution was that there should be an annual lifetime achievement award. And so I think that that would broadly encompass all the people that fall through the cracks or don't meet a specific criteria. So uh, and the first name that comes to mind for me is Frank Zamboni. So, so Frank Zamboni invented yep. the ice making machine that made the modern professional indoor game of ice hockey possible. Right. And so that innovation in and of itself created the industry that we now see as, as the national hockey league. And yet, you know, how, how do you how do you honor that achievement? And I think, you know, somebody in the Zamboni family should at some point receive a lifetime achievement award for that. And I think if you did that every year, or maybe if you didn't do it every year, but but if you if you found those people that that slipped through the cracks, that made contributions from for 30, 40, 50 years mm -hmm. that that positively impacted the game, that, that would be a way of, of honoring them. I, I think the player category in the Hall of Fame works as it is right now. I think the builder category yep. works yep. to an extent, uh, but I do think there are people that that fall through the crowd. Like, sh what what about Paul Henderson for a lifetime uh, achievement uh, award? So he exactly. again, you know, his playing career was he had a good playing career, but he had that one shining moment, which again transcends sports and 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 changed how we view international hockey. Yes. So all, all of a sudden, yes. Canada plays Russia in an eight game series. And suddenly it's like, hmm, maybe they do play hockey in places other than Canada and they play it pretty well. And soon after that, you know, Borja Salming comes to the NHL and, and Inga Hammerstrom and, you know, slowly but surely, you know, the European invasion um, happens. And, and if that series goes any other way, like if Canada wins easily, you know, probably everyone's ignoring European hockey. If the Russians who had the lead hang on and win the series, you know, we probably come back and mope for five years, uh, and, and it may have set us back. Exactly, right? and so, so the fact that that series went the way it did and ended the way it did, and because Paul Henderson scored the goals to won the games for Canada in six, seven, and eight, that that is an achievement. Now, is it a? Does it meet the Hall of Fame criteria for a player? It hasn't yet, but it would sure meet the lifetime achievement award well, that I'm pitching. I, I so I love it. I so, love it, and and. I just I can I can and, list a whole bunch of and I'll give you one better than that. I think you call it the Zamboni Award uh, because right. it is not the NHL Hockey Hall of Fame. No, it is the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yeah, and I would argue that what individual has had more impact on all levels of sport than mm -hmm. what Frank Zamboni provided. Sure. So then it becomes the Frank Zamboni Hockey um, Commitment to Hockey Award. You leave it a little loosey goosey so that you you do have that flexibility, and then you hand that out to the you know, to the Paul Hendersons of the world or, or, you, to, know. you know, to the Fran riders, you know, who, right. who tirelessly worked to, to make women's hockey what it is sure. today at the very, very early infant stages of, of the game. And, you know, so, thus far anyway, has largely gone. What about a guy like red story? Yep. Right. And, yep. and, and people like that. I mean, we got a lot to catch up on that way. Sure. Um, uh, scouts, you know, like they're, you know, at, at some point, you know, like scouting, because it's such a collaborative effort, it's very difficult to say, you know, this person is the greatest scout of all time. But, you know, I mean, you know, people talk about Barry Fraser or Jerry Melnick or or some of the people that scouted for a long time and, and you know, year after year after year drafted, you know, great players that, you know, that, that created NHL well, dynasty. There's a couple in Detroit that probably deserve that credit, yeah. right? Yeah, some of the European scouts that, uh, that brought those Swedes over. So, you know, uh, like I say, I, I think that if we're having the discussion about, you know, where the Hall of Fame can be better, to me, that is how the Hall of Fame can yeah. be better. Funny, we started off with the Chris Snow Award. 
Yep. And then we ended up with the Zamboni. Uh, Frank Do we Zamboni have too award. many awards, though? You know, how about if we no. get rid of the Mark Messier Leadership Award? Am I allowed to say that? Yes, you are. I will defend the Mark Messier okay. Leadership Award because I think leadership. There's too much management, not enough leadership. No. I, I don't know how much it's actually going to the right person based on. I loved Adam Lowry's quote about how Andrew Ladd brought him up mm -hmm. and. Yeah. You know, he have you told a, that story? Yeah, I have. Can you tell it? The well, uh, the, you know, when the, when they were coming up together, Andrew Ladd bought all the dinners yep. and said, you know, and then when you're me, then you pay it. This forward. is Shifley, not Lowry. This was Shifley, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you do it. Yeah, exactly. That's leadership. Okay. Oh, exactly. Yeah. But but would anybody ever think to give it to Andrew Ladd? I might, yeah, because I really but, but admired what, and respected and what he what did. And that's what I think he should. That's where I think the Mark Messier Award. I, it just feels like the Mark Messier Award is. That oh, who didn't get it? Who didn't get what? Oh, yeah. we need to do something real nice for that guy. Yeah, right. It does feel a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, the not the NHL, not the anybody. Um, okay, I I have to know now. If Canada loses, mm -hmm. and we come back with our tails tucked between our legs. At what event are we talking well, about? 72 now. Okay. You brought up 72. 72. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I just assume uh, you know what's in my head. And the reason <laughs> the reason I say that is Ken Dryden's coming in on Monday. Uh he's got his new book out. Mm -hmm. Uh so I'm, you know, I'm I'm thinking a lot about that. But 72 yeah. to me remains this quintessential our Canadian world moment, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, that this is when we stared the red menace down yeah. and and we we tied the series or <laughs> you know what I mean? But we won the series. But what if the Russians had won that? What would that have done to the psyche of this country considering the Cold War? What would that have done? Um, could it have done something so much that it could have turned us off that the WHA wouldn't have started four or five years later? And, and you know, it leads to all these chains of events. Like, how important was that? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer. Nobody um, would. Yeah. Right? Uh, and, and that's probably a great question to 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 address to Ken, but I, yeah. I think that you know Canada at that time. I mean, again, if you if you read, um, like Ken had another book on the anniversary. Scotty Morrison ha yep. had another book, yep. um, and there was a great book uh, called "The Ice uh, War Diplomat," um, written by Gary Smith, mm -hmm. who uh, was the Canadian liaison who worked with with the Russian team, who offers some great insights into the psyche of of, of the Russian team and and how things were there. Um, and I think he had some, because he stayed in touch with a lot of those Russian players after the fact, had some insights into what might have, what might have happened if the Russians had won. But, uh, you know, again, if, if that final game, one of the things that, one of the scenarios that was talked about by all of the principals was that that game looked like it was going to be a tie. Mm -hmm. And so if it had ended in a tie, and a lot of people may not remember that hockey games ended in a tie, then the series would have been three, three, and two. Yep. And the Russians said, uh, you know, in the ahead of the final period, that if it does end in a tie, we are going to claim victory in the series on goal differential, which is how world championships were decided right. in those days. So, so there was precedent. They, and they were within their rights to do that, of yeah, course, yeah. That, but that's not how it works in the National no. Hockey League, right? No. In the National Hockey League, if, if, if there's a deciding game and it's, it's tied, you know, you, you play overtime and and you decide a winner in the playoffs and um and so i i think that that if it if it had ended in a tie i think and the russians had claimed victory that a whole bunch of people in canada would say yeah yeah that's how you do it but that's not how we do it and 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 it's a tie and and and, and there would have been a real schism mm -hmm. uh at that point about how uh how to perceive that that series yeah i don't know i, I mean i and and I can't even actually give you. Normally, I would speculate, but uh, um, but I, I haven't given it enough no. thought. And 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 I guess you know simply because that is the result, and that's you know like I was that kid cheering in the Absolutely. Neil McNeil High School gymnasium. It just it you know, but I I was a kid that loved hockey. We all loved hockey, and and it just reinforced in our, in my mind that. Uh, but it did that, launch like the the Canada Cups and everything yeah. that came with it, and it launched that sense of sure. pride we had. With our national team, exactly. Right? But yeah. but but the one thing that, that they talked about a lot in the seventies was that the one thing that the that Canadian players and 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 our country, the attitude is that that we persevere and we dig in when things get mm -hmm. tough. And and as a high school student, 
that that was a lesson that was not lost on me. The idea that, you know, when when things are tough and and things are looking bleak, dig in, dig yeah. in. And and to me, that was a life lesson. Yeah. And, and I and I don't know if other people saw it that way or absorbed it that way, but it it just felt like like we are learning something about how to do things the right way, and and I don't know. I, I, that that's that's one of my takeaways from that series. I I and I don't say this to be the old guy or whatever. But this generation of hockey fans won't ever have that. You know, the original viral moment took place in Vancouver, did it not? When mm -hmm. Phil Esposito, sure, yeah. when the fans booed and Phil yeah. Esposito ripped into them, yeah, like you know, no, nobody had ever done that. It was, it was, like, it was serious. So what you're saying is, all these interviews that we get after the first period, the second period, where they mumble a bunch of inanities back and forth, and then they they cut to commercial. That was a real. Oh my exchange. god! And oh and, my god! Yeah, so you're right. That is something that lives on virally. But you know, I think there. You know, if I was a young hockey fan right now, it'd be like, yeah, more of that, more of that honesty, more of that. We sucked, or you know, you yes. sucked, you fans sucked. Yes. Just something real, rather than something you know cooked up that just sounds like. We have the speech. best fans in the world, right? We have the best fans in the world. Anyway. Oh, we're so lucky. Any, anyway, I just. I love but, the but, conversation because and you me, do by the way sound like an old guy now you know I so know, i was giving I, you credit 20 minutes ago I for know. being young and innovative and now now you've gone now in, i'm an old now, man now you've gone into kids. cranky you old guys guy. don't know what it's like <laughs> to fight the red menace um uh, but I see. I, okay, so the reason why I got stumped by you, you were talking about seventy-two. I thought you were going to look ahead now to the next time there's best on best, because I thought that that would be the the next logical evolution of of the conversation. Because we've it's been so long now yeah. since since we've seen you know best on best hockey that yeah. that it's not just a generation of players that haven't had a chance to do. Like Connor McDavid hasn't it's, worn you know like team candidates in, in, in best on best. So. So a whole bunch of people that care about the sport have haven't seen it since the World Cup in and 2016, I, and probably not going to see it before 2026. And 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 to me, that's a and I get uh, it now though, because before I before it was so easy Eric, to go oh, as a business, you know, oh, you got a business, you know, you can't get the rights for the videos, you can't do that, you know, uh, insurance, it's a business, it's a business. But you're right, like when when do we get to cheer? For our country when's our country get to stand up you know we got rolled over at the royal cup right you know thank god we have the women because they're the ones who give us those moments but well and i just think that the appetite i mean you know i, I was at all of those i mean i was in sochi not a great hockey tournament to be honest with you but uh but, pretty dominating performance yeah oh they were great you know but they were like this defensively efficient machine and and you know everyone talks about you know hockey that lifts you out of your seat so not yeah. much of what happened in sochi and i was I was there, uh, lifted me out of my seat, but Vancouver sure did. Um, Salt Lake City sure did. And even Nagano, um, even though, you know, Canada lost to the Czechs uh, in the middle of the night, not everybody saw the game. And when they saw the result, didn't bother watching the game. But that game against the Czech Republic was unbelievable. I was just sitting, you know, 10 rows sure. up at the Big Hat Arena. Uh, ice was tilted Canada's way. Hashik was monstrously great in goal. And Robert Reichel of... <laughs> of the Calgary Flames uh, scored the the goal in the shootout off the post that beat Patrick Waugh, and, and that was the end of the very first, but it was an electric tournament. And even in the, you know, in the in the gold medal final, when the Czechs won, uh, it was pure joy to, to see that team celebrate. And it was like, okay, you know, you can step back from being a Canadian American, a Swede or whatever, and just enjoy the moment as, as somebody that cares about the sport of hockey and the impact that it has. And so that's the kind of thing that, that the, 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 the NHL and the IHF yeah. and the IOC and the players association and everybody else, they have to start. They have to understand know, that. They have to do something about it instead of, of just you know pushing it back and pushing it back and pushing. It back. I get it. I, you know, yeah. I talk, I've talked. To, I haven't talked to him recently about it, but the number of times I've talked to Bill Daly about it over the years, you know, he keeps stressing that this is not the work of a moment. You can't just wave a magic wand mm. and, and create an event like this. The logistics of it are complicated, and I get that. But it's time to you know push a little bit harder than they've been pushing right now to, to get this. And I you know I, I do think that they will if if you're asking for. A forecast. I would say that um, a World Cup 2025, I guess, is a possibility. But for sure, 
2026 Olympics is 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 going to be a go, and and the level of excitement for that simply because it'll have been 10 years since mm-hmm. real genuine best on best. Um, I think you know the the hype and the anticipation will be through the roof. It will it match what happened in 2010 in Vancouver. I was working for the Globe and Mail in those days. We put out a, a section every Tuesday leading up to the season promoting the hockey tournament. And I remember talking to you know Steve Eiserman lots that year and and. Oh my God! The you know the yeah. pressure on him and his group to to select the right team and and on the players when they got there was was just so weighty and the fact that they were able to eventually overcome all that and then again, you know sometimes you know it, it's the nature of the outcome. Like would that uh, be as memorable an event if the Canadians had simply hung on to win in regulation? But no, you know the Americans tied it late and then yeah. you know Sydney calls you know uh, Jerome's name Iggy and then puck goes to him. And, you know, past Ryan Miller, you know, laundry all over the ice, you know, country erupts, people writing on deadline for the national newspaper have to respond in 30 seconds. It was, it was quite an experience, I can tell you. Last one, and I'll let you go. Where does 87 fit, though? It, it, to me, again, one of the, you know... The, the, that, does it fit in with those Olympic games? I think so, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, to me, the succession is 72, 87, 2002. You know, like oh, a, that's the list for you. If, in 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 terms of of the of the order, if you're a Canadian hockey fan, mm-hmm. right? So you go seventy two progresses to eighty seven, mm-hmm. progresses to two thousand two, progresses to two thousand and ten. Okay. Yep. And as I said, you know they won in twenty fourteen and, and sixteen. You know a win is a win. Um, you know, but the nature of how those you know again eighty seven right six five in the third game the memorable goal it's 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 results and outcome but it's also how you you get there and you know if you're a sports fan you know it comes down to that moment where it's going to go this way or it's going to go that way who steps up who makes the play how does it look and then how many times are you going to see it replayed on on television so i mean i think i could you know that goal in 87 you know who is it that's going to the net <laughs> howard chuck or larry murphy it's larry murphy or larry murphy yeah yeah because yeah. larry murphy's the guy with the dumb <laughs> grin on his face in the picture right yeah <laughs> anyway uh, i mean it's you know like gretzky hesitates and and, and yep. gets the puck to the and you know it's it's in the net and uh howard chuck was on that line though right oh yeah yeah, yeah he yeah. was on that line yeah Actually, after I said that, I thought to myself, "Who was it that went?" <laughs> it was Larry. No, it was Larry Murphy. I, I just, yeah. I just know that Kretzky looked and and saw Mario coming as the trailer. And it's like I know because I'm a really smart hockey guy. Who I want to get the puck, to. and he got <laughs> into the right guy, and and Mario. Speaking found. of generational players, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for this. This was so much fun. All right, I appreciate it. It's good to see you again. All right. Um, two weeks from today, yeah, we'll get you back in. Uh, by then, uh, who knows? Maybe it'll be the proper time to overreact. <laughs> oh, absolutely we'll overreact to something it'll be the end of the month right yep. yeah, or close to the end of the month so by then we have we can make all kinds of snap less than a month around. away from american thanksgiving which is the bell the bellwether exactly for... at that point don't even have to play anymore no nope. right? no he's in yeah. <laughs> thanks eric <laughs> all right thanks rob eric Dachek, everybody from uh, the athletic uh kind enough to join us live in studio today courtesy of our friends at ski seller snowboard ski seller snowboard Dot com 76 years uh in calgary three lo- or four locations i should say but normally once that's once the snow starts flying right now two locations mcleod trail by chinook center and bow ridge road northwest i mentioned it on monday ken dryden has a new book out he will be joining us uh, always a pleasure to talk to ken uh quite honestly a challenge to talk to ken because he is one of the um real bright intellectual uh just everything around this game he has the the credentials the history the background uh, the education uh you you don't just accidentally interview ken dryden um so we'll be doing that on monday uh peter mars back with us next wednesday right now though we bring jack in any questions or comments today jack lots of questions here rob okay we'll start off with some flames line combination questions ah, here line combos uh igor sharon govich yep. skating on the fourth line already Mm-hmm. Is this trade not looking so good? Yeah, no, it's over. It's a failure. It's a complete failure. I think they should fire Craig Conrad. Um, no, I, I think it's a matter of fit. Um, Sharon Govich has been on the wing. Sharon Govich has been in the middle. Um, Sharon Govich is here because he's a penalty killer, first and foremost. Um, I got to be honest with you, he didn't pop for me in, in one game, but 
Um, part of it too, which I, I kind of really believe in is you got to put them with players that he can be successful with. Um, you know, uh, Coronado with Ruzicka. Look, as long as Ruzicka is producing, you got to play him. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning, even of the first game, right? That was mm-hmm. a question we got, Jack. The first game of the preseason, like, why is he playing up there? Because the expectation for this kid is you've been in the NHL now, you need to go, you need to pop here. So, as long as he's up there, he plays there. Um, you know, my hope is that Sharon Govich was gonna gonna find regular duty on on Backlund's line because I think that's a nice little bit of speed. But um, you know, no, I, I, I look t- Tyler Toffoli is going to get incredibly insane points this year, incredibly insane points this year. But Jersey's not going to be able to afford him, and he's going to end up on another team, and he's going to be he'll, he'll go help another team. Sharon Govich has to develop, and the Flames see something in him. Um, God bless, uh, and then God rest his soul. Uh, Chris Snow had something to do with this, you know, and, and the work that he does on the analytics side. Um, this is a guy they wanted. Sticking with the lines here, Gilbert in, Osterley out. Did Osterley not do enough in that first game to stay in the lineup, you think? I would like the snot that Gilbert can bring. I would like the physicality that Gilbert can bring. I did not like their their coverage um but i don't think it's a scheme thing i think it's just they're thinking about it oh where am i oh i'm supposed to be here okay i'll go there um you know i think you got to be physical with everybody on the road um osterley was fine he didn't stand out for me but he didn't pop either i keep using that word pop um you know really liked hannafin really like uyghur really like zadorov's um you know, uh, physicality and, and what can you say? Anderson, I think Anderson's their best defenseman. Um, I don't know if how much argument there is there. Um, but on the same token, what I didn't like last year was, uh, Mackie sitting for five months and, you know, other young guys sitting for five months. So yeah, mix them in. Last look, one. look at that. A Pat thing. But I didn't realize Pat's there. That's Pat. <laughs> there's Pat. All right. <laughs> Uh, last one on the lines here. We talked about sure. it earlier. Man uh, jumped up to that first line mm-hmm. near the end of the game mm-hmm. there. Is that the long-term fit on that first line? Or is it gonna be... we, uh, we talked about Dubé, and I, I've always believed it's Coronado. I think Coronado is going to be the guy that finds his way there. I think Mangiapane can play up and down your line. Um, I think you get the right um, combination with Mangiapani and Ruzit uh Kadri and you you know you get somebody else going they could take your number one lines time in a game like not you're all you know not long term or every game um but I I like Mangiapani's flexibility I I just think the right heavy right shot release um you know I, I thought if anything that that Huberto was guilty of of trying to be too pretty and too cute and trying to do too much but when he calmed down at the end of the game, I mean, that was a world-class feed to, to Lindholm. You know, that was, he can, sh- he can pass. And I think, you know, Coronado is going to get to those. So I think the long-term is Coronado there, but we'll see. That's, and remember, that would be putting a rookie on the top line in year one. That is not a Calgary tradition, right? Yep. A couple uh, questions from your past career here. Yes, sir. How hard was it to go from play-by-play back to the radio? Hated it. It was really hard. Um, the hardest part was because I love the um, I love the prep. Like I love the work that I got to put in to prepare for a game. I love the challenge of learning about something new. I love the challenge of of bringing up um, something that that people go, "Oh, geez, I didn't know that." Um, you know, really proud of dug a deep one out about Kippersoft's brother, who was a defenseman for the Islanders, and they never did play together in the same game. They were both dressed for the same game, but they never got to play together. I love that stuff. Um, play by play is an art form, and it's fun to do when you're good at it. Um, and I was okay at it, and so I got frustrated sometimes. And I think I've been quite upfront here. I that I would get names in my head and I'd mess them up. And, um, uh, you know, they, they made the right move. Uh, I have no qualms about that. I miss it dearly. Um, but if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't have gone back to radio right away. It was just too fresh, too quick. I thought I needed the job. Um, I was, I was miserable. Uh, I was not a lot of fun to be around. 
um, hard not to take some of it personally, uh, tried really hard to be professional as off as much as I could, but, um, I missed it. I miss Charlie. I miss Larry Isaac. I miss Dan. I miss a lot of the crew, uh, Lonnie and those guys, Al, uh, Mar um, Mar yeah. So it was really, really hard. Um, and I don't think I, I, it took me a long time. I'm not sure I ever really got back into it. Um, you know, I don't, I didn't, it's funny. We had the Pat picture up there. I didn't think it was fair to Pat because Pat was doing afternoons and they brought me back and stuck me in mid afternoons and eventually moved me back to afternoons and flipped him around. That, that's not fair to him. He, he was, he was ready to do that. And, and the problem is I'm, you know, I'm old school. Um, you know, I love having guests. I love doing long form conversations and stuff like that. But some of the things those younger guys want to do, I'm just not good at. And, and I always felt bad about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's 10 years this April. Um, it was crushing, man. It was absolutely crushing. Um, but I say this with all sincerity, my responsibility, nobody else's. It's not that anybody had it out for me or anything like that. I just wasn't good enough. Um, having said that, uh, 2021, um, 21 or 22, 21, uh, got to do the Stockton Heat, did 11 Stockton Heat games. That was the most fun I ever had in broadcasting, period. End of story, stop. Better than the SJHL, better than the AJHL, better than the Western League, better than the NHL. Um, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed those games. Um, probably because I wasn't climbing, like, she's okay, if I do this, maybe I can get there and everything like that. I was doing them because they needed somebody to do them, so I did them. So I got to prepare, and I got to have a little fun. I got to drop in my wrestling references. You know, Brandon Weiss, who's the um, media relations guy in Stockton, was a huge help, and we we developed quite a friendship, and he's a really good friend to this day. So, yeah, yeah, it was hard. I I, 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 I probably owe everybody an apology. I, I think when Sportsnet fired me from television, I probably should have gone away for a while and gone and done something else. Um, and to Kelly Kirsch's credit at, at Rogers, he, he tried his best to make it an easy transition for me. But, um, when you have a lifelong goal and you achieve it, the, the mistake you make as a dreamer is if I can just get to the NHL, if I can just get to the NHL, that shouldn't be the dream. The dream should be, I got to get to the NHL. And I got to be there for 30 years. I had the, I just want to do NHL games. I got to do NHL games. My dream should have been, I want to go to the NHL and stay for 30 years. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. Okay. Sticking with that, can you tell yep. the story about how you got the play-by-play -play job with the Flames? Yeah. So, um, in about 2006, 2007, uh, I had some conversations with uh, Carlo Petrini, um, who was uh, you know, Flames TV, but also the, the producer for... Um, flames pay-per-view and i had done some stuff i had done some hitman games and you know i'd done a lot of junior a i'd done the talking goalie and i'd done the designated fighting and all. so you know i had a little bit of a reputation and then uh when peter got honored by the hockey hall of fame um i actually had to do 10 minutes of flames because pete was down on the ice along with uh with uh, uh getting uh, uh recognized by the flames for uh um you know, for being in, uh, not, or, uh, honored with the, uh, the hall of fame. So Mike Rogers and I did, and it was a St. Louis game. And I called the Darren McCarty fight and Damon Lanco scored a lot happened. And, and people were really, really nice. And they played it on the morning show. I think Mike Richards played it in the morning show. And a lot of people had fun with it. And Ken King sent me a note and he said, Hey, we, we got a lot of positive emails. Can you send me the clip? So I sent Ken the clip and then, um, about, Two years later in the summer, I got a phone call from the Flames and they said, hey, uh, we'd like to add you to pay-per-view. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Do you mind me asking doing what? Because <laughs> I had no clue. And they said, we want you to do play-by-play. -play. And I was absolutely stunned, floored, had no expectations, didn't apply for it, had a long conversation a long time ago. So went back to the radio station and said, hey, I got this opportunity. Would you guys mind if I went? They were really good about it. Kelly Kirsch was always really accommodating and knew what I wanted to do. 
Um, so I got the pay-per-view job and I, I did pay-per-view for two years and then, um, they stopped doing pay-per-view. Um, and, uh, I, that was 2009, uh, 2010, 11. I just went back to the radio and then, um, 2011, uh, in July, I got a phone call and because I can't do things normally, I have to make it more difficult. I got a phone call and gentleman out of Toronto. I don't really want to get into the Toronto names. I, it wasn't a great relationship with those guys. And, um, but, but they gave me an opportunity and, and they said, Hey, you know, we'd like to bring you aboard and, and, uh, have you do, uh, flames play by play. And I said, but what about Peter Labardius? And then there was a long pause. It's like, Oh my God, I finally get to dream. I finally get my dream but I'm replacing a friend of mine. And uh, I, you know, I say this with great sincerity. I was ecstatic to get the job crushed to have to replace Pete because I like Pete. I think Pete's a great broadcaster and I wouldn't have gotten rid of Pete. He's not the guy I would have got rid of. Um, so took the job and worked with Charlie and, and Roger and, uh, uh, you know, um, did it for three seasons, one and a half of which was a lockout season. They weren't great seasons. They were a lot of things. But honestly, um, I will pass on into the next next world knowing that I achieved a goal, which was to do play-by-play. -play. And um, I wasn't anybody's boy, and that's a media thing. I've never been anybody's boy, um, and that's just the way it is. And and uh, um, that's okay. And by that, I mean I, I – you know, I had no real champion. Like there wasn't anybody pulling for me at Sportsnet going, we got to get that guy and, and protecting me or anything like that. But I don't care. Like I got to do, I got to live the dream, man. I wanted to always wanted to be a play-by-play -play guy at the NHL level. I got to be a play-by-play -play guy at the NHL level. If I had to do it all over again, I would have changed my dream. My dream would have been to be a play-by-play -play guy at the NHL level for 30 years. If I was, if I'm self critiquing myself, and I think I've told this story before about the conversation I had with Ken King after I got fired. And he said, you know, that you know, that you cheered too hard for the visitors, which crushed me because I was always constantly getting into trouble for cheering too, or my scorgasms for flame goals and stuff. I would show, I would, I would submit to the, uh, the court, uh, 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 December 22nd, uh, 2013 overtime win by Calgary over, uh, uh, St. Louis where Giordano scores the game winner. Listen to that and go, yeah. Oh no, he's, he's not a Homer. Um, I was, but I took the Peter Marr approach, which was if they're a good goal, it's a good goal. Anyway. Um, I spent too much time worrying about my preparation and not enough time worrying about my technique. Listen to Rick ball. Rick Ball's technique is flawless, um, just flawless. Um, you know, he, he's in and out in the right places. He doesn't stutter. Um, he, he's, he's light and funny when he needs to be. Um, I think, and this is, this is going to sound like a shot at Kelly Rudy. It's not a shot at Kelly Rudy. But the one thing about Rick Ball is you could put a mannequin in the booth and he could work with that mannequin. Um, Kelly goes to Hockey Night Canada. He gets Jason York. He gets Cassie Campbell. He gets whoever. He does a remarkable job. Um, I just wasn't that guy. I, I I could get excited. I could tell you things. I could have some fun. I could I could do that. You know, I, I could be the character of a play-by-play -play guy. But Rick Ball's a pro's pro, and I just wasn't a pro's pro. So... Um, that's how I got the job. <laughs> I guess I, I ended up in a place. Uh, sorry about that. The question was, how did I get the job? Well, that's how I lost the job. <clears throat> At what age did you know that is this is what you wanted to do? I recorded on the family stereo play-by-play uh, -play hockey games when I was nine years old, ten years old. So the, they had the the old, if you remember, old realistic the old Radio Shack brand. Uh, my dad had a realistic microphone and a cassette tape deck, and I would throw a cassette in, and I would do imaginary play-by-play. -play. Um, I chose at the age of 14, when I got to high school, uh, that I was going to become a forest technician. And the reason I tell this story all the time, as a matter of fact, I tell it to kids at Mount Royal. Um, the mistake I made was I was under the uh, impression that my I had to have a 
professional job. I needed to be a professional to please my parents, which is absolutely the, the they had no, no knowledge of this. They didn't know this. This was something that I put on myself. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't, academically eligible to go to universities in the eighties, but I was academically eligible to go to trade school. And, uh, I hold a, I don't know if I hold that distinction anymore, but I hold the rare distinction of applying for forest technology at Nate. And my second choice, cause in the eighties, you had to give a second choice, uh, was radio television arts. Um, everybody that applied for forestry always put environmental science or whatever, you know, reclamation pro uh, oil and gas or whatever. I was the only one. I really wanted to take, um, television and radio when I was uh, 17 because I, I graduated at 17 without a diploma, but I, gra so I guess I didn't graduate. I left high school at 17 after I finished grade 12, got into Nate without a high school diploma, thought I was doing the right thing, ended up in Fort McMurray. I was a force tech, uh, force uh, officer too for the Alberta, what was then the old Alberta force service, which is, I don't know, lands and forests now, basically a forest ranger. Uh, and then I just started, uh, uh, volunteering at, um, ABC TV 10, because back in the nineties, that's how, if you got a cable, uh, cable license, you had to provide X amount of hours of local, uh, cable programming, uh, in the community. So I ended up doing that and, uh, you know, started doing oil barons games on TV. So I would have been 22 when I first did my first oil barons games. Um, then, you know, went to, came back to Calgary in, in 95, 97, that's at Nate, at Sate, I should say, then moved to Estevan, did play by play out there and, um, you know, chased the dream ever since. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I knew right when, to me, Peter Marr, Rod Phillips, the guys that I heard in this province were artists. They just, you know, I was the kid that stuck the transistor radio under my pillow and listened. And, you know, I was the guy that, you know, go out in dad's car and in the middle of the winter and, you know, try to hit the skips and find different play by play. I just, I thought the ability to call a game and, and to, to tell that story and to paint that picture was the greatest thing in the whole world. Like I, uh, I looked at them as the same way as people looked at Bob Ross or, you know, uh, Robert Bateman or whoever. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I just thought they were artists. So yeah, it was quite young for me actually. Rounding it out here with one more Flames thing. Sure. Kind of a prediction one, your favorite. Yep. Uh, Love predictions. For this upcoming road trip, how many uh, games will the Flames win here? I'll pull up the schedule for okay. you. Okay. Give me the schedule. It's a five-gamer, is it not? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I will say, I, and I only got alerted to this last year. I don't know. Had you heard the term before, like um, scheduled loss? Like last year I heard that. When I actually, when I came to work here, oh, that's a scheduled loss. What do you mean it's a schedule? Well, you look at the schedule, that's a loss. Yeah. I uh, that term. All right. I don't see any schedule losses here. Um, I don't see any soft uh, games. Um, I think, you know, all of them are going to be challenges, but I look at this and, and go 3 1 and 1. 3 1 and 1. That's if they come back 1 1 and 3. Or one, three, and one? No. No. That's not good enough. Yeah, I don't think it's a very tough schedule. Like, if you look at those five teams, who's a lock to make the playoffs? A lock? Yeah, none of them. There isn't a lock in that group. Nope. There's a bunch There's a bunch that could. I could see four teams in the playoffs from that group. I could, but not a lock. Yeah. I just don't think Columbus is there yet. They're pretty bad. Yeah, they're going to be bad. And, and Detroit... You know, Buffalo, that was – Buffalo may be the best of the bunch if, if last night kind of straightened them out, right? Um, don't know what to expect from Washington. Boy, I didn't like Pittsburgh at all against Chicago. I guess we'll see tonight when they're in Washington, right? Yep. So. Yeah, I'm off to you too. Like three, one, and one, four, and one. I think they can pull it off. Yeah. Need to. They, they need a good start. The, 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 this is not a division that lends itself to falling behind three and seven in the first 10 or something like that, right? It's just too much, you know, it's going to be done, but you, you spend up too much equity trying to catch up and all that. Um, thanks to everybody for the questions. Those are great. Final mile today. Um, a, a tip of the hat to the Calgary North Stars. Um, they, uh, they've done some really, really cool things the last couple of years. I work with them on some community projects, but um, 
last night there was an event at the Dome celebrating the life of, of Chris Snow and, and young Cohen Snow's teammates were there in their jerseys. That's what sports is about. That's what being a teammate is about. That is, that is a great lesson. And I, I, I tip my hat to the Calgary North stars and I know all the, I know all of the different, the Royals and everybody else would have done the same thing. Absolutely. I know that, but I was so happy to see Cohen, uh, Chris's son running around in his North stars Jersey with his teammates being there for him. I, I, that's what sports is about. That's, that's really what we want for our kids and, and why sports is important. Um, and my last one is is just um, Kelsey Snow. I, I talked briefly with Kelsey. Um, she was a rock for everybody. She was a rock when I talked to her. Um, she was a rock star when she talked to Ryan Leslie on the broadcast. We talked about that last night. She wasn't going to do it for everybody, but you know Ryan has the trust, and and she trusted Ryan, so she did that. Um, I just. I'm in awe of her. I'm in awe of her, um, the way she has handled all of this, the way she has allowed the public to live this with them so that something good can come out of this, so that people can see they're not alone. Um, you know, yesterday, today is really hard. Um, it is, but Kelsey, uh, just incredible, just a rock. So, if you get a chance tonight, think of her. Um, think of the snows. Uh, a little while from now, it's going to get a little darker when the everything calms down and, and everything goes away. But we'll check in. We'll make sure she's okay. She's going to have lots of support. The family will have lots of support. But I just, I cannot say enough things about Kelsey Snow. Thanks to that, man. Jack, uh, quickly becoming the most important person on this show, which didn't take long and it's not surprising, but clearly the most important person on this show. Thanks to you guys for for taking part in this journey with us. We're back. Very excited to have Ken Dryden in with us on Monday. Peter Marr on on, on Wednesday. Hall of Famers, Hall of Famers, Hall of Famers. Um, we don't squawk and squeak, but we have Hall of Famers. There's got to be some value in that. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you soon.